sponsored by the Women's Center at Florida Junior College. Our guest today is Maggie Kuhn, founder of the Gray Panthers, dedicated to fighting age discrimination. Right. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Maggie, I am 34 years old and I want to know what I can do to keep from becoming a bag lady when I'm 60 or 70. Can you give me some advice? Well, you know, we're finding that there are more and more bag ladies. And I, I think one, of the, one very important uh, matter for you to consider is a pension system that is portable and that you can take with you as you move from job to job, from career to career, from company to company, so that when you, when you leave your job, hopefully by choice by that time, because we will have eliminated mandatory retirement, you will have a, a secure income and that we will do our part to protect the Social Security system from further erosion so that it will be uh, safeguarded and there for you so that you will have uh, economic uh, security uh, for your old age. You will, have, you will have the essentials to keep you alive. But are people generally prepared for old <coughs> age? They know it's coming. Do they really believe it? Do they start well, they, early enough? They think it'll never happen to me. <laughs> It happened to my grandmother and my grandfather, but it's not for me. But uh, all of us are growing old, and I think we, we don't realize that the aging process begins with the moment of life and continues all through, uh, and that it's a gradual uh, a dawning on us that, after all, wow, our bodies uh, give us some warning signs. Uh, but I like to think that, that life time learning the way we have in junior colleges, the way we have in, in Florida Junior College. Uh, people can learn and grow, I think, right up to rigor mortis. And to learn and grow and to, to, to be more in touch with the world around you is another way to, to keep alert and alive until the very closure. Speaking to keeping alert and alive, you have been rather critical of the, uh, the medical profession for prescribing drugs very heavily for yes, older people, yes. for attending to dismiss complaints as hypochondria. Yes, 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 what yes. role would you like to see doctors play in the aging well, process? Well, we've been working with the uh, American Medical Students Association as Great Panthers. Uh, the, Amer the American Medical Students Association are, are very much in our corner uh, and, and fighting the kind of ageism uh, that has infected and afflicted the American Medical Association. Uh, the present generation of men and women now in medical schools are highly critical of the curriculum of medical schools uh, where they have not learned about the diseases of late life. Uh, they, and, and in their abysmal ignorance, uh, they think that it isn't worthwhile to treat a person. Uh, and anyway, the whole medical system is geared to, to acute care, instant cures, a miracle drug. So we've been persuaded by powerful uh, media uh, uh, blitzes that drugs will do everything. And if the doctor doesn't know what to do f for you, if he's really in the dark about your symptomology, it's easy for him to write a prescription and to persuade you to take this three times a day. As is, ignorant as you are of the uh, results of it. Is there not a lot of hypochondria, especially among older women? Well, is it's, there is, but this is because people have not had any, any motivation or inclination to reach out beyond themselves. And when you're lonely, when you've lost your job, your spouse, when many of your, your best friends have died, uh, you're turned in on yourself. And of course, every ache and pain is, is magnified in your head, uh, and you become hypochondriac. But if you have a goal, if you have a purpose for living, and if you're reaching out to others, I see hypochondria receding. You know, it's been said that people don't really change when they get old, they just become more of what they are. Uh, how do you make somebody stimulating and interesting when they're 60 if they were rather dull and boring when they were 20? Maybe you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can, but I'm, I'm hopeful by nature, and I like to think that there are elements in this new age that can persuade people to change. What makes you different? How come you're not well, a wrinkled baby, as you call them? 
I'm wrinkled, all right. I've got wrinkles, you know. Your definition of a wrinkled baby is somebody who's content to sit safely in a playpen. Said, right. A and lot of your contemporaries are, and you're not. What made you different? Well, I think I decided when I reached uh, retirement age and was forced to retire that the rest of my life would be a life of outrage. Just sheer unadulterated outrage. And I've found that it's absolutely beneficial, it's therapeutic, um, <laughs> and it, it, it's an infinite impro uh, um, improvement over Geritol. It beats Geritol. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if you had not been forced to retire, would you have gone gently into that good night, or uh, would you have been a rebel? I think I would have found in my late life an opportunity to speak out. You see, because people in, in, in their later years uh, have certain credentials to speak out uh, and certain historical perspective, you know, to reinforce you. And my generation has lived through more technical questions and no, more technical changes than any other g group of people in human history. I can remember when people didn't have telephones. A little, a, a child who was four asked me uh, last, the week before last in Michigan, what was my favorite television show when I was her age. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that dark? Life without television, it's hard to believe. <laughs> and and she, she didn't believe me when I said, well, when I was your age, we didn't even have radio. But that was just beyond her comprehension. But it reminded me of how, how much we have, have changed in our outlook and, and our accommodation to change, our acceptance of change. And why not be a part of that changing scene in one's late life? Why just settle back and be stuck in the past when we never have been? We have a question over here. Back to your talk about health. Once I heard you speak of the fact that uh, people in hospitals felt so threatened by that situation. Mm -hmm. And once you were hospitalized and you got together kind of a bill of rights, did you not, for other patients? Yeah, yeah. Talk to me just a little bit about that. Well, there is a bill of rights for patients, uh, which we worked very hard to extend to patients in nursing homes, residents of nursing homes. And it, it should be interpreted to, to patients when they enter the hospital. It seldom is. Uh, it, it should pr pr prepare them uh, to refuse treatment uh, if, they, if they feel that it is not in their best interest. It should, uh, it should prepare them uh, to ask questions and to speak out and speak up instead of just shriveling back in your hospital gown and <gasps> be afraid. Uh, we've been working on, on the role of the patient advocate and in the new health emphasis that we're, we're shaping up this spring and summer in the Grey Panthers nationally and locally, uh, we're looking to patient advocates and we would love to see retired persons uh, have some training, we're developing a manual for that, and a job description of what the patient advocate does. And we think if there was a patient advocate in, on every uh, floor, uh, following the patient through the treatment plans, and particularly at discharge, the care would be better, the follow-up would be much more humane, uh, and people would get well faster. The, and, and malpractice insurance would be cut in half. Doctor, we have a question here. Uh, you suggested outrage as yes, a good yes. stimulus to yes, bring yes. us old folks yes, yes. back into the community. Do you have any other recipes to uh, get us back into the world as stimulating people? Well, I, we've spoken earlier about lifelong learning, and I think to refresh our minds and spirits with new, new data, new facts, uh, is another kind of stimulus. But I like to think that each of us can uh, develop in our late life uh, a whole new set of goals for ourselves, new purposes that enable us to to rise up in the morning even when you're above the arthritic pain. Uh, we triumph over, over a, a sagging body uh, with a spirit of mi uh, and mind that's vibrant and alive. Uh, I, I like to think that, that we survive and thrive in old age when we have a goal. 
We have another question here, sir. Yes. Uh, Maggie, what uh, part of the country did you first, uh, your movement first start? Uh, we started in New York. I the see. Great Panthers, uh, with six of us who sat down uh, in the university city area. Uh, in fact, we were having lunch at the Inner Church Center at 475 Riverside Drive, and we said, what are we going to do with the rest of our lives? What are we going to do? And to answer that question, we started the Great Panthers. Uh, are your goals similar to Claude Pepper's? I would S think so. Somewhat similar. Yes. Claude and I are friends. I think and, he's a wonderful man. And he's a wonderful man, and you all who are Floridians uh, have, have somebody very special as your, your advocate in, in yes. the House and in the Congress. Yes. Uh, he's really, much respected. And, uh, and I do, I I've been retired a couple of years, and I do a lot of reading, very much reading. Uh, the local Florida Times Union yes, before yes, it's yes. light, and the Wall Street Journal and the yes, New York yes, Times yes, about yes. when it gets light. And I haven't heard much about the Gray Panthers. Are you, uh, you're not predominantly uh, located in the southeast, I don't well, think, are you? Curiously, we have had, we have had more difficulty uh, organizing Gray Panther groups in Florida than in any other state. Uh, people don't want to be serious about, about public affairs. They've come to, come to Florida to play. Uh, and 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 they're they're very transient in Florida. The, in Florida, the people who come from the north go north to visit their children every summer, and they visit so and so and so. You know, on the west coast, they're all they're, The mayor of Clearwater called his his population irresponsible gypsies. Yes. They're always on the move. Okay. Well, now if if it's any consolation, I'm a member of the Recycles, and we'll be playing for you tomorrow. There's about, I'm delighted. There's I about thirty of us. There's music. probably seven or eight of us here, and after we give our concert tomorrow, you may be become uh, world renowned. Oh, I look, I look forward to that. I look forward. Thank you, Maggie. What of the uh, one of the uh, functions of the Great Panthers has been in looking into various industries that yes. affect the, the, the elderly. Hearing aid industry, the nursing home industry, what yes. have you found? So well, we've found that, uh, that very powerful chains uh, operate nursing homes for profit. And the profits, the bottom line, much more important than the welfare and, and the good care of the, of the patients. Uh, two of my housemates at one time, Linda Horn and Alma Griesel, uh, did a very uh, probing investigative research in nursing homes. And we found that, that the profit motive is in many instances the thing that, that, that does it in, as far as patients are concerned. Uh, we're also looking at the profits that drug companies make. You know, they're enormously profit, profitable. And drugs, many of them are, are prescribed, and, and we insist that we get a pill when you go to the, you don't feel as though you've been properly cared for, and they should get a prescription. Now, we would like, uh, we're, when we launch this new health emphasis, we're going to be looking at corporation profits. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to encourage our Great Panthers uh, to buy a share of stock in certain corporations, and then raise I'm not going to mention the word, in stockholders' meetings, express our outrage in the way in which profits uh, are put before people. And we're not against profits, but they ought not to have the overriding consideration. Maggie, how can older people safeguard against being taken advantage of? Well, I think we, we need to know, for in, first of all, much more about our bodies than we do, uh, and, and protect ourselves from from the things that are going to be harmful to us. Uh, self-awareness, self-care, self-help are new ideas that, that are alternatives to the medicalization of life. Uh, there's much more attention that we're paying now to nutrition. Uh, we're, 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 I'm so interested that, that so many older Americans are, are doing community <coughs> gardens uh, and, and raising plants and growing <coughs> vegetables. Uh, which of course are marvelously healthy, and the exercise itself is is therapeutic and and joyous and socializing, so that when we protect our bodies and and we respect ourselves and our years, and when we reach out to young people, 
we, we can make it. Oh, we have another question over here, ma'am. Yes, mine is not so much a question as a commentary. I'm sure, uh, Ms. Kuhn, you will uh, agree that we should have an expansion of older American volunteer opportunities, yes. such as foster grandparent yes. programs and yes. senior companions programs. Yes. And you must know what a benefit these programs are to older persons who are able to take themselves out of their retirement and yes, get back into yes, the mainstream. Yes. I, I would appreciate you commenting on this. Well, I think it's one, it was one of the great things that came out of uh, the whole social, uh, legislation. social, social legislation. And I, I regret very much that, that Reagan has cut them back. As the foster grandparent program is the only one that has really survived very, because very drastic because, because, of, Nancy because of Nancy's uh, interest in it. I wish Nancy had gotten interested in other, other programs. Well, I, uh, I think that she's done a great deal for this program, and I think probably with uh, a lot of community support that uh, this could be continued. And I, I also feel that these programs should be picked up by the local communities because they are essential and vital in the local communities. Absolutely, and, and a lonely, uh, disadvantaged child, a handicapped child, a child who has those learning disabilities could could grow and 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 with the love and attention and care of a foster grandparent. We have seen that. You've seen and, and the old person who is lonely and who has lost perhaps uh, who, who's lost contact with with his or her own grandchildren can have uh, uh, alternative grandparent children to love and care for and both do well. But I've seen uh, the senior companions uh, do marvelous things to, to help uh, lonely, uh, frail, older people avoid institutionalization. Uh, de Tocqueville, you know, the French uh, sociologist when he visited uh, America many years ago, said that one of the distinguishing characteristics of America was the way in which we, we volunteered and we, we responded uh, to the needs of others. Uh, and and uh, we're still doing it, and I hope we continue to do it. Maggie, let's talk about some of the social concerns of old people. You have been rather vocal about uh, the sexuality of older yes, people, yes. Uh, how, ne how society has a sort of negative feeling. Adult children do, too. Why? Well, it's one of the myths that uh, Dr. Robert Butler alerted us to in his book, Why Survive. There are six very prevalently held myths about old age. One that it's a disease. Uh, the second is that it's mindless. You can't learn anything. Your brains get soft. Senility is inevitable. Everybody's going to be senile. It's just a matter of time, which is absolutely a lie. Uh, much of so-called senility is the result of poor nutrition, constipation, poor medical care. It could have been utterly, uh, completely avoided. Uh, and the third myth that I think is one of the most cruel is that old age is sexless that in our old age we lose the capacity to love, to be loved, we don't need it anymore, our sexual impulses wither and die, and that's not true. Uh, we're, we're human sexual beings until rigor mortis, and, and the only reason why many people don't have opportunity is because they there are not opportunities. You would like to see society be a little easier on uh, the relationships of older women and With younger, younger men. men. How young are you talking about? I'm talking about men in their 20s and 30s. Why would a man in their 20s Indeed, and 30s... Indeed, I have a loving friendship with a man who is 30. Are we talking about a sexual relationship? A sexual relationship. But there are all kinds of sexual relationships. There, 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 you know, there, there are degrees of it. And we, uh, we, we have appropriate sexual responses in many, many ways. But we, people are surprised and shocked. But, in, but in, in, in the third world, third world societies, uh, the, the older women of the tribe were the ones who introduced the young men at puberty into their sexual rights. But in they this society... They showed them how. In this society... With love and compassion, because they knew. But Maggie, in this society, men are taught to put a heavy emphasis on youth. Yes. And with so many young women, why would a younger man be interested in an older woman? What would they have to offer? Well, for one thing, <laughs> young men... You taking notes out there? Young <laughs> men require people who are patient with their, with their sexuality. 
and older women are patient and loving. Young women are immature and insecure in their sexual roles and impatient. You know, excuse me. And Benjamin Franklin said they're also very grateful. Yes, that goes. But, but it isn't just the gratitude, but it's, it's the sheer joy of, and, 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 and if we, we not, we don't need to think of, of, uh, of intercourse, coitus, uh, as being a part of a proper sexual response. But to have young companions as I'm privileged to have, men and women, I'm blessed, really. I never married, I have no children or grandchildren. So I delight in, in the young friends that I've been privileged to know and to love, and who love me. For a woman your age and, and of your background, uh, it, people would consider that unusual because of the social pressures on women in those days to marry and to have a family. Well, but when I, when I graduated from college, way back in the class of 1926, there was a choice of marriage or a career. And that was it. And that was other. it. And there were the married women were were unknown in the workplace, even in traditional women's occupations like social work and teaching. You did not marry unless you were widowed and you had to marry. I mean, you had to work. Then that was a, that was condoned. So there was a whole generation of us, and then in more ravaged Europe. I visited Scotland uh, in the 30s, and the village that we, that we toured to uh, had no men of marriageable age to my peer group. They were all dead, killed in the war. So that there, there's a generation of women who have not had that opportunity with men who are their age peers. But they could have loving relationships with men who were younger if society didn't take such a dim view of it. We have a question over here. Ma'am? Oh, you spoke previously about uh, how to uh, prevent from becoming a bag lady. Yes. Uh, uh, the community that I, I lived in, uh, there were many of these individuals, yes. and I know there are thousands yes. that exist. Yes. Yes. What can be done today to help the people that are bag ladies? The, 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 this, there's growing awareness of it. In San Francisco, for example, where there are many, many bag ladies uh, and, ba and vet men uh, of different ages, but most of them are in their later years, uh, the Grey Panthers in San Francisco uh, have organized a Grey Panther group in, in the Tenderloin where the, where the bag people congregate uh, and have, and um, uh, the marvelous uh, churches uh, in that area, uh, Glide Memorial Church uh, has responded and, and there are marvelous ministries encouraging these people to come, uh, giving them food and giving them shelter, uh, giving them hot baths. Uh, and, and dealing with their anxiety, their fear. One of the things that has happened in San Francisco, and I think it could happen again in, in populated s places like St. Uh, like Petersburg and, um, and Miami, they have initiated uh, interchanges with the, the stores and the, and the uh, shops in the Tenderloin, and they have what they call safe houses. And anyone who is afraid, you know, there's a great deal of mugging and, and violence in the Tenderloin. And anyone who is afraid or who is hungry or who, who has any, or sick or any human need can find a way to a safe house. And the safe house has a stylized picture of, the, of a bird with sheltering wings, a, a kind of uh, a, 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 a stylized, a depiction of the Holy Spirit. You know the way the Holy Spirit, the dove descending. This is the dove, uh, a safe house. Uh, in Philadelphia, we have, we have been working through churches, through a neighborhood center, uh, and with, uh, with the, the, the bag ladies themselves, 
uh, many of them, we've discovered, are, are former mental patients. And when governors discovered that it was cheaper to balance their, their budgets, their health budgets, by discharging the mental uh, patients who were elderly, putting them out on the streets, uh, that's what happened. Many people became bag ladies. And they're, they're disoriented, many of them, and utterly lost. They're really tragic. Bag ladies are one of the uh, elderly characters you see portrayed on television. There are others. How would you perceive the image of the old person on television? Well, let me say in a positive way that, the, that, that that is changing. Johnny Carson used to put do out blabby until I told him that he had to stop. And did he? He did. Uh, we've been, uh, Lydia Bragger has been monitoring the electronic media for a, about more than 10 years. Uh, she's been complaining and commending uh, television shows, producers, advertisers, and she's been, uh, her good offices and, and her committee have been um, engaged by uh, CBS and NBC to do workshops to sensitize the, the, the television industry. Norman Lear has been very much interested in what she's done. And we've seen some positive changes. Over Easy has been a show that has been made to older Americans. And, and you see occasionally some, some very good programming depicting old people in a positive light. It isn't all disaster and disease. Well, it's good to know at least one of the goals is, has worked out. I wish we had more time. We are out of time. I want to thank you, Maggie Kuhn of the Gray Panthers. I want to thank our audience. I'm Pat Broderick. Thank you for joining us.